to News from Underground. This is, well, the 25th of December. Christmas time is here. And we have a lot of interesting stories to relate to this holiday special. Uh, first thing we want to talk about, well, that was our announcement. Merry Christmas. The War on Christmas. Ohio man is being fined a day for a zombie nativity scene. Jason Dixon is at it again. The Deer Park, Ohio businessman has set up a nativity scene full of holiday spirit. Only his neighbors aren't too happy about his sense of humor. With it all, and neither is the local government. Of course, of course. <laughs> it's always their business to you know what your business is. Uh, so apparently last year, there was a, a zombie nativity scene, which included skeletal, wise man, uh, demonic, baby, demon, Jesus, in a, in a manger, of course, and fulfilling the whole nativity scene. And last year, this caused him to have a lawsuit. And uh, the thing, though, of course, with this guy, he's not trying to go out of his way on this one specific day of year. That's his business. <laughs> he runs a horror house, 13 rooms of horror, I believe. And just, you know, it's your regular haunted house location, right? Uh, but, of course, him trying to fulfill, uh, I guess, the extension of his personality. Hey, here's a fun day for me to dress up my lawn. Everyone likes to dress up their lawn as well. Um, and there's how I, you know, make that into art. So what, what exactly is the argument against this? I mean, so there was a uh, last year he didn't apply for a permit. Apparently, you need a permit to put things on your own lawn, and so he, he didn't apply one. He got a lawsuit. This year he filed a permit. He, he he went and paid the extortion fine for permission to use his own property and design it how he wants, but they still deny him. And uh, they're saying, well, thirty five percent of your property can do that, but you're exceeding that amount, which is a lie. <laughs> uh, he's measured it and it's like, this is not 35%. So are they finding him over an aesthetic disagreement or is it because he's charging people for uh, running out this? No, it's, it's because of blasphemy. This yes. is effectively no blasphemy. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some of his neighbors are upset. Oh, okay. And of course, whenever they're upset, they tattle tell on their parents to punish uh, but their this, this isn't a private community, there aren't any community rules that he agreed upon? Uh, of course, they don't really agree upon, and government enforced community rules. And so the local government, which he gave no consent to those rules, forces their preferences on, onto him and his land. Um, and so one of those preferences include uh, not designing or making things. Uh, if you're going to do that, you have to apply for a permit. And, but it can't take up more than 35% of your yard. But of course, everyone else on the block is doing it and having their own Christmas show and on their rooftops and whatnot. It's, you mm -hmm. know, um, and angelic creatures and whatnot, but they don't like his, his version that brings him, I guess, heavenly peace on earth. <laughs> and it has to be uh, to do horror stuff, like uh, the recent guy who did uh, Freddy Krueger recently, that was his name, Wes Crave. And he died? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Sorry, <laughs> Actually, I wasn't that big of a fan, but, but I have a friend who was. Right. But he probably already knows. Yeah. So that's so they're extorting him now, five hundred dollars a day until he takes it down. Oh, that's ridiculous. Ooh. Right. Uh, so like a free side response to that would be, of course, what would you just say? You know, what are the rules that he gave consent to? Right. You can have that. You can have those community standards. You can have finally because of that, no large monopoly on a community like Virginia enforced to everyone here. You abolish the state, you abolish government, you have thousands of free society space and consent, then you can have your Halloween town. I would have a timeshare in that town. <laughs> it would be great to live there and everyone have their spooky Halloween house always set up year round. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a lot of fun. And that's a welcoming community that would never place him in such harm or jeopardy or uh, rob from him like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but because uh, here, this is mob rule country, majority preference portion to the minority. And so the greatest evil into the minority, right? So to knock out that utilitarian, uh, this, this argument. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what's going on. You know, Merry Christmas for this guy. But he, I think he's trying to run a fund for people to help pay him to see how long he can go uh, and well, do this. Long. This this really stinks of stuff like um, the, the same stuff that happens with the EPA too. The EPA will, if, if you have, if they can announce somehow that you have some animal that spends any amount of time on your property, they can basically dictate how you use your property. And uh, there are all sorts of cases where, you know, people have actually bettered their property and the EPA are fining them thousands of dollars a day 
be, uh, until they turn it back into wetlands or, or something like that. It's completely bogus. And it's the same thing that's happening here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that is... You that did is something horrific. we don't like, so you know what? We're going to steal from you and extort you and... It goes to where government uh, values more the animals and, and the environment than they do human beings. And the feels. Yeah. Don't forget the feels. Yeah, and the feels. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think of another area in which they do this, uh, architecture. So like here in Richmond, you have a lot of homes that are, have to be stuck in the past. You know, people talk about like, where's all this new innovation, new architectural design. There's a lot of city code that says if your house is built in a certain time frame, we got to keep it historic. So if you're trying to, your, you know, facade of your house is falling apart, you can't replace the window shells. Uh, it has to be the exact same kind. Uh, so you, you can't uh, upgrade, you can't advance, you can't enjoy new, <laughs> live in the modern world. You got to be stuck in the past. And so that, yeah, that, that affects a lot of, I guess, terms of aesthetics. Uh, the last place you want to find aesthetic choice would be government. None of that is, uh, I guess, art that everyone's forced to pay for. It's not art. Take a picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in better news, well-armed activists openly defy Texas law to feed the homeless, hundreds clothed and fed. The folks over at the aptly named organization Don't Comply looked, took to the streets just outside Austin Street Shelter in Dallas this weekend to perform what has now become a revolutionary act, feeding the homeless. Last December, the Dallas City Council enacted Ordinance 29595, which makes it illegal to serve food to the homeless without jumping through a status myriad of bureaucratic hoops, including a fee, training class, and written notices. Do you think when somebody makes this ordinance be enforced, they do it like in for Palpatine, like initiate ordinance 29455? <laughs> <laughs> See if they like that. I hope so. That would make it at least a little more legitimate in a theatrical sense. Right. <laughs> and then you see stormtroopers in bike shorts shooting all the homeless people. Right, yeah. Where's your permit? Where's your permit? This is actually similar to something that, um, that happened in Orlando, where I used to live. There was a, an organization out there called Food Not Bombs. And they had to openly defy the police. Of course, they were all commies, too, so they, they didn't... Uh, I don't think they were real all into the guns, but... Um, and they had, to, they had to openly defy the police, and that became a big thing, because they were feeding the homeless against the law. And, they, and you know, people were arrested for feeding homeless because they were in the wrong public space when they did it. Or, and it's, it, it really is kind of a, a war against vagrancy. And it's it's despicable. It's like okay, you even if even if you argue that that many of these people really made the choices that put them there, and, and a lot of them did, you're still basically just saying okay, you're down on your luck. Kick you while you're down, and we're going to use violence against you just because we don't like the way you look, the way you smell, and where you know where you happen to roam. Yeah. Uh, without government, who will point guns at you to stop you from helping uh, up your neighbor? <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's disgusting. It, it, it's really gross to me. And that's how government creates the poor. The government has no incentive to take care of the poor. If they did, they'd be out of a job. Uh, yeah, and, and of course, there's a, a story in D.C. of this guy named, I forgot, I forget his last name, first name Michael, I believe in. He, he didn't pay, he paid off his house in full, everything paid, mortgage all paid off, he's retired and everything, and he didn't pay like a $156 property tax bill, extortion fine. And the government just came in, swooped him, uh, kicked him out of his home, put a lien on it, foreclosed it, and that was that. Yeah. What's mine is mine, what's yours is yours until it's mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a fantastic display of freedom. Um, good people have a duty as you might say, to um, break bad laws. <clears throat> um, so there's obviously no victim here. Um, and it's beautiful that they actually arm themselves uh, to be able to retaliate against any government bullying. So some thugs show up with guns, at least you have guns to symbolically represent your, um, yourself. Right. As a free person. I think, I, I think that's great that they did that, that they open carried when, it, when they did it. Because the, um, you know, it's the same thing that happened with the Bundy Ranch. They came with a show of force, and they said, we're not going to let you take this guy down. Right. And, and it, it was similar here. And they said, we're, we're not going to let you, you know, prevent us from helping people. So. No, yeah, it's great kudos. to see uh, the community coming out to do that. 
maybe it might be then a different story if this one person went out there, right? Oh um, yeah. So that's that's pretty cool. That's that's an awesome uh, thing to see. This is uh, just happened. Uh, I guess the you know it's also another recognition that the police are not there to protect you. <laughs> the same story as before is trying to prevent you from uh, feeding the homeless. Uh, yeah, these men with guns are here uh, to threaten you likewise. That's why they carry those guns. Um, I guess there's one here that I mentioned, like uh, civil disobedience. That's one word that always kind of uh, irked me a bit, just the word itself, because it seems like it acknowledges there's someone for you to disobey. You know, what kind of person are they to be in the position for you to obey in the first place, to call it disobey, right? They're not your parents, they're not your, it's not your father, it's not your mother, it's not uh, nobody. It's not uh, nothing legitimate there. I uh, just recognize it for what is as a slave master, and there's no disobedience or obedience. You're a slave, <laughs> um, not uh, in the area which has to be uh, denote that kind of relationship. This this act the way you would if you were free, right? That's what these men are doing. Uh, the police are not there to protect anyone. You have to provide your own protection, uh, and it's great they went out there to uh, confront some of these. Uh, these guys, <laughs> these thugs. That's one of my favorite parts. The, the guys, uh, the, the, the authorities, quote unquote authorities, tried to, to force these guys to fill out the paperwork. They just looked them in the face. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. Not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. They said no. And then they just went about their business. Yeah. And that's how it should be. Right. Now, that's, that's, that is a good story. <laughs> So next, New Jersey girl calls 911 after touching Elf on the shelf. Police say seven-year-old Isabel La Peruta of Old Bridge was worried because according to the popular children's book, the magic of Christmas goes away if the elf is touched. So, uh, fortunately, no one was hurt. The situation was resolved peacefully. No, you know, no guns were drawn. But uh, apparently what happened is the mother came out to find her daughter kind of shooing away police saying, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I meant to call my father, you know, I, I, you know, whatever. And it turns out what happens, or what happened was that the, the girl was playing ball and she accidentally knocked over this Elf on the Shelf doll that came with this, uh, this, this children's book. Mm -hmm. So the legend goes, or the legend that started in like 2004, goes is the um, scout pixie elves come out from North Pole and they come into your house and they hide in various places in your house and they sur they watch the kids, they surveil the premises to make sure the kids are behaving properly. And when the, so they do, do this from Thanksgiving until Christmas. And apparently if you touch the elf, if you find the elf, you can't touch it, but it, it hides somewhere else. And if you touch the elf, then the magic is over and whatever. So that's what happened is this girl panicked over having accidentally knocked over this elf on the shelf, touching it. And now she's, you know, I'm sure she's terrified that she's not going to get any presents for Christmas or, or whatever. So. And she called these murderers to come to her home. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's really, that's really an issue. You know, how, how does that, what does that say about how we raise our kids is it, when we, when we have them called violent gang members at, at the first, you know, first sign of trouble. Right. And these are the people that we tell them that is going to help and that's going to protect them. Yeah. Uh, my uh, brothers and sisters, when I looked in the fridge of the house, the number they have for 911 is uh, call cow. <laughs> Uh, you know, someone that's not going to hurt you or shoot your dog, as, uh, as happens all across the, uh, the United Tax Farms of America. And yeah, I think that's, that's a horrible solution, I guess, for her to, to assume that. Um, you know, you should kind of have these backup plans with your kids, you know, do not trust these people. Uh, there are, a lot of them are like pedophiles like the one in Manassas, you know, don't trust these guys. These guys are, are able, it's difficult to fire them. It's like firing bad teachers, it's difficult to fire bad cops. Uh, I mean. Their vocation first begins in initiating force and robbing you, so you can't trust that alone. Um, but yeah, that's uh, I guess that was their Krampus, right? You, you called real, real monsters to that situation. Um, what do you think about the whole, also, the um, surveillance aspect of that? Yeah, so uh, I was looking at this actually, and this is a this is a point that was brought up 
uh, earlier in, in, a, um, in a critique about the, the Elf on the Shelf marketing phenomena, um, you should say. Because apparently this thing completely exploded. Not only are these, these creepy elves being sold everywhere, they're the, the books are getting like Christmas specials on TV and everything. Mm. And it was actually brought up that that this is um, that the elf in the shelf phenomena is getting children used to the surveillance state. It's it's a customizing them to being watched all the time. And I I kind of agree with with that. This is uh, this was brought up I think by Professor Laura Pinto. Hmm. And uh, so so let me just read this passage. Uh, Professor Laura Pinto suggests that it conditions kids to accept the surveillance state and that it communicates to children that it's okay for other people to spy on you and you're not entitled to privacy. Hmm. Which I think is spot on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I'm actually almost surprised that these these don't have the, uh, the Barbie doll cameras. Because uh, I don't know if you remember, but Mattel used to... Uh, a little, not not even too long ago, Mattel was marketing a Barbie doll with a camera in it that actually uh, uploaded footage of your child hmm. to a database that you could watch, but it's, of course, being stored by Mattel. Right. Which is just enormously creepy. And I'm almost surprised they haven't tried, tried to do that with this. They may have. Uh, I guess if they already are telling these kinds of stories, they're probably already spy cams in the house. Um, that's, yeah, that's a horrible environment for the child to not be able to trust you or you're not trusting the child. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there's no freedom of privacy there. Uh, respect for self-ownership to have that kind of space to yourself. And yeah, it's a horrific environment. Uh, the, this entire, the entire concept to me is a sabotage of trust because not, not only are you conditioning your child for surveillance, you're, you know, you are sabotaging specifically that trust between, you know, the, about their behavior, but also you're lying to them. You're, you're feeding them. And, and I, I understand that not everybody who, who does the elf in the shelf thing is actually telling their, their child that this is what's happening. But that's really where the marketing phenomenon, uh, phenomenon is going. It's, it's really, you know, it's, it's having, it's by uh, parents and children cultivating this this fantasy and it's a lie that the child will eventually find out that in what does that say what does that what does that do to their perception of reality that is really a sabotage of of your child's reality and this this actually segues into into another thing we wanted to discuss about santa about speaking about lying to your child about the existence of santa so what do you guys think about that uh, 100% agree. I think, I mean, you can have games, you can have uh, stories, you can have all these things, right? We can pretend, you know, you can have imagination, uh, but to lie to your child and not relying on their own senses, you know, to give them the tools that they'll need to succeed in this world once they fly away from the nest, I think it's a horrific thing you can do to a child. And because a lot of the times that they, they'll, they'll find out by going to public indoctrination camps and then be made fun of for believing it for so long. Yep. Uh, you fall for that life for that long, uh, you know, and then you encounter bullies. And yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, you can, you can talk about Santa Claus, you can talk about all this magical stuff and uh, make it as real as you pretend a lot of stories, right? You kind of suspend, uh, I guess, belief in a way, reality when you go to movies to kind of put yourself in that story. Yeah. Same thing where you yeah. read books. There's, there's nothing wrong with fantasy and, and I don't want to imply that at, yeah. at all. You know, fantasy is a, is a great thing. Sometimes you just want to let go. You want to, you know, but actually, actually lying about it, you know, actually putting your, your child into this position where they really believe this, you know, you need to establish, you know, you, you need to make sure to, you want to tell, you want to teach your children to be able to separate reality from fiction. Right. And mixing the two, I think is really sabotaging them in, in the future. It's, it's sabotaging their mind. That's what government does, uh, yeah. combining abstract and concrete concepts, concepts to make it difficult for you to, to separate the two, right? Mm -hmm. So you believe that a social contract is real, you believe, uh, you know, the vice versa of the terms and uh, their definitions. Uh, it's hard for you to separate objective reality from subjective or the abstract concepts. Right. Yeah, that's uh, not a good thing to do to a child. So, um, Isaac, uh, what, are, what are the origins of this story? I mean, where does this come from? 
Um, a lot of modern Christians tie it back to uh, the stories of St. Nicholas, but others draw it even further back. Um, some good work to check out is The Pharmacratic Inquisition. It's a documentary you can check out on YouTube or buy from Gnostic Media. Um, there's also a book, Astrotheology and Shamanism. But um, the modern day Santa Claus is a counterpart to pre Christian Northern European shamans who actually dress up like their holy sacrament, which was in this case the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Um, so if you Google Amanita muscaria mushroom, you can see it. It's a popular red mushroom with the white dots on it. Mm -hmm. um, if you look back to even the early 20th century, and uh, even to the modern day, you'll see a lot of uh, Christmas memorabilia or iconography with the mushroom placed. Uh, the chimney sweeps in uh, late Victorian England would always be uh, little children who would have these little mushrooms on the Christmas greeting cards. And it's like, what is this association? Um, Sounds like you're doing Christmas. <laughs> right. But if you've ever wondered why people bring evergreen trees into their house and place gifts under them and decorate them with ornaments, um, there's actually the similarity that the, the shaman would pick Amnita muscaria from under the trees, place them on the trees to dry because he's going to have to carry them around in his sack to the neighboring villages in late December or uh, near the winter solstice. So he would actually go out and... Um, since it's so snowy, this is an arctic area, um, he would usually have to go through the chimney because the door wouldn't be accessible because of the snow. So he dropped down in through the chimney and get people the uh, Amanita muscaria. Um, and it was likely that he traveled there using reindeer who also enjoyed um, imbibing the substance. Of course. And they would actually uh, gather the urine from the reindeers and you could uh, actually trip on that. I've, that's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I was like, are these the same stories? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> what time frame was this, did they say? Oh, this was ancient, ancient Christian, mm. um, Northern European, uh, Siberia area. <clears throat> nice, nice. They know how to, have a, they know how to rock it. <laughs> That's why I'm mad every holiday I spend with my family. I've been waiting for this guy. <laughs> That's the story I'm going to tell my kids. <laughs> someday some guy might come dropping through and bring us mushrooms. <laughs> we call him Papa Noel. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there's also Christian roots that uh, a lot of people are unaware of. Like you have, during back then before Christianity, dominated pagan religions from the like, Mediterranean area or Italy. <clears throat> The Romans, or soldiers particularly, uh, practiced a pagan religion called Mithras. And incidentally, Mithras was also born on the 25th. He has a lot of uh, similar stories as Jesus does. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, sometimes this draws an interesting parallel. Like, if you're going to be now the dominant culture uh, or political class in that group, the way you, you force the lower ones to submit is to, uh, not by taking away their holiday, but just to appropriate the same celebration of day. Right. Okay, so you can still celebrate. We're just going to call it something else. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, um, the, the, it, the Christian religion actually mirrors a lot of ancient religions. And um, there's, a, there's a pretty good book on this called A History of God. It's by Karen Armstrong. And she, she's, a, uh, she's a PhD in, in um, I think, some sort of religious, religious studies. And uh, theo um, not theocracy, but... Uh, you know, the study of, of religions. And she outlines a lot of the similarities between, uh, between this, the Jesus myth and the, the like, uh, ancient Egypt and, and even before. Hmm. And that, that's, that's pretty interesting, right? Right, I guess you have... Well, in some circumstances, they're not only myths, but instructions. So um, by the time Christianity came into the picture, a lot of these uh, ancient religious uh, rituals um, were being taken over by the Christians and being told as an allegory or a story that you interpret exoterically, um, mm -hmm. where if you were to interpret the scriptures um, with uh, an occult sort of understanding, they're actually instructions. Uh, the story of the three wise men is actually an astro-theological event. It's like storytelling with the stars of this time of the year. And that would signal to the people um, just carrying on the traditions of even uh, eating the mushrooms, for instance. Um, yeah, well, just about all of this kind of goes to the, um, 
a whole lot of religions are, are really basically just the sun. You know, mm-hmm. God's based on the sun. Like Jesus, you know, is a, a risen and, and uh, dies. You know, a, uh, is born, dies, and is arisen. It's like it's a uh, imagery of the sun that just you know, uh, and the the yeah I've heard that um, that the three the three wise men are, are like Orion's belt or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the scarab and uh, an Egyptian is about bringing. It's like uh, the ferryman uh, <laughs> carrying them into uh, the afterlife across the sky. Uh, the beetle, you know, the dung. The way that it rolls around, that being the sun and the scarab, therefore, is the one that kind of guides uh, the body or the spirit into the afterlife. Mm. So we've we've cut the uh, we, we've cut the mystery. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> is, a <laughs> Jesus is the solar poop guy. <laughs> <laughs> but so, of course, goes back. Why would they be upset about this guy doing a zombie scene? Scene, right? Yeah. He's, he's just coming back from the dead. That's not the definition of a zombie. Uh, I don't know what is, and I, I thought it was. I saw the I saw the nativity scene. I thought it was really entertaining, and I, I'm not even a fan of zombies. You know, I'm not even, I'm not really right. a horror uh, horror flick guy, but I, I thought it was clever. I thought yeah, it was clever. yeah. <laughs> poor guy. Um, I think there's a tie into the drug war and drugs. You want to bring up? Uh, that wasn't me. I think it was you. Oh. <laughs> well, I draw a similarity between the modern day war on drugs with. Um, how religion in the past tried to demonize these drugs, um, when in reality a lot of their traditions, just like today, how we're celebrating Christmas, people nationwide are celebrating Christmas, but uh, we demonize <laughs> drugs when this tradition is most likely based on a psychedelic mushroom ritual. Um, well, that's, uh, I mean, the demonization of drugs really didn't come about until the Abrahamic uh, exactly. religions. So mm-hmm. I can't even, I don't even. I can't even think of any any other religions that are, are specifically like that. I, I'm not I'm not well knowledge. So. I guess they don't, they want to prevent you from having these inducements of experiences that make you seem I guess otherworldly or outside of these body experiences um, to see God because the only person who can speak for God is like the Pope, right? These specific yeah. characters. Um, I've, I've heard a lot of things like the. Um, like Christianity and, and well, the, the Abrahamic religions being largely based on just obstructing the pineal gland, <laughs> and because uh, the pineal gland is is pretty much is that's what releases DMT in into your brain. Mm-hmm. So um, you know th- these people that are smoking DMT and taking ayahuasca, what what they're doing is, I mean, I, I think a lot of them what what they're doing is they're compensating for something that's actually been lost because you can actually do that. If you you know, if you know how, by yourself, and if you if you have a fully functioning pineal gland, you can have all sorts of really interesting experiences just by dreaming, because that's really what causes dreams is DMT. Hmm. So wow, no, uh, the only other, well, the way I've heard is just I guess if, if you die or something like that, your mm-hmm. body releases a lot of that. And that's true. Right. Yeah. Maybe it helps soften the kick in the can experience. Mm-hmm. I guess, um, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of I guess unfortunate with that. Yeah, it's something to remember. And there's still a war on people, a war on drugs. Prohibition is not over. Um, that's that's one of the front lines I think in, in the war for liberty is the, is the is the drug war. Right. I mean, you can go in West Virginia to try to pick up zinc from the ground or ginger root. Uh, it'll be thrown into a cage if it's not within their specific time frame when you can go out in the woods and pick up plants. Yeah, that's despicable. Yeah. Um, but the, the drug war is the, the drug war is what has our jail population as the largest in the world. Right. That is that is the cause of our of our new gulag, the neo gulag that we have in America. It's a war against the daring idea that you own your body. Yeah. yeah. So uh, with that, yeah, Merry Christmas, guys. <laughs> happy Christmas. Kwanzaa. Uh, happy Mithras for you pagans. And uh, I'm Cal Molloy. Isaac Markison. And I'm Phil, the anarchistician. See you guys at Virtue Party. Take care. I'm ready to master on my tormented past. Swallow the
pain Follow the mental terrain It takes a hell of a man Nowadays to maintain Garments flesh stain Face bruised and battered Eyes reflect agony Of dreams that were shattered It never mattered To the so-called general Republic About my nation's situation And how we rise above it And then other When we self-destruct and kill our own And the greater responsibility Yes, it's still our own We should know by now That the system is designed For our demise If we have lives, we'll be left behind Dollar signs rule But what about the fool? Falls victim to the material world.